Hi, everyone. So my presentation is about design aspects that we need to take into consideration when we design post-tensioned slabs in high-rise buildings. Um, this is a list of the main topics I will discuss today. Um, the impact of the floor layout on the design of PT slabs, the level of restraints that these slabs are subject to, um, typical tenons layout, few tips about modeling, um, the minimum concrete grade that we have to use, and some aspects related to ultimate limit state and serviceability limit state design. And at the end, just a quick mention <coughs> to post-formed holes in uh, already cast PT slabs. On this slide, I put some of the projects I've been working on um, at WSP for the past three years, uh, where we provided from concept to uh, final PT design in some cases like um, Western Green, the one at the bottom right. These are all uh, medium to high-rise buildings with number of floors ranging between uh, uh, 40 to 60. And there is, they have all some common characteristics. And one of that is the floor layout. I've just taken three of those projects as an example. Um, as you can see, the distribution of the structural elements is very similar in all these projects. We have a, a central core, which represents the stiff element, an external line of support with um, the PT slabs uh, spanning in between the two. So from a design point of view, this is considered a favorable layout, which means that when we apply the pre-compression to our slab, the slab is, is able to shrink towards the core and take almost the full pre-compression we have designed the slab for. Um, in this situation, usually we don't need to use pore strips and split the floor in two portions like we have uh, when we, when, for example, we have two opposite cores and the PT slab spanning in between <coughs> the two. So in order to make sure that the slab is taking the pre-compression, usually we allow for a pore strip and split the pore, the full floor in two pores. We stress each single side, and then we fill the gap in between later, usually after 21 or 28 days. In this case, this is not necessary, unless we, for buildability reasons, or for a maximum amount of concrete that we can pour in one go, or to split the tendons if they are too long and we don't stress, we don't want to stress both sides, so we can split the, pour, uh, the floor into by using simple construction joints. Um, this scheme is on TR43. Um, he suggests a method to calculate the forces that are taken by the column, so and the consequent reduction of pre-stress in the slab. But bear in mind that this is applicable on high-rise building, mainly on lower levels, because on upper levels, both the slab above and the slab below, the one we are designing, will move the same amount towards uh, the core if the layout is very similar. So both the column above and below will move the same amount so that the slab is usually able to take the necessary uh, pre-compression we designed the slab for. Um, TR43 also suggests that if the level of pre-stress is around two megapascal, the floor is not very long less than 50 meters, and um, there is only one stiff element, like in the three examples I've shown earlier, we can basically ignore the effects of restraint. A slightly different situation we had on Newfoundland. In this case, instead of having a line of columns along the perimeter, uh, concrete column, we have a steel diagrid system that for constructability reason was uh, built um, ahead of uh, um, the PT slabs and connected to the central core by uh, node levels, the two, for example, the two highlighted here by the red arrows. And the PT slabs were then later cast in between and they are represented by the three dotted uh, lines. So in this case, we have, when we cast the PT slab, we have 
a node floor above and below, which are not PT. They are a mix of uh, steel element and concrete precast elements spanning in between the steel beams. Uh, so they don't move the same amount of the PT slab uh, in between. Plus the diagrid system around. So the level of restraint offered by this structure can potentially be much higher than what we have with normal uh, concrete columns. And this is something we need to take into consideration in, in our design. Talking about the tendons layout, typically we have a single drape parabolic tendon spanning uh, perpendicular to the slab edge. And parallel to the edge, we have uh, uh, classic tendons layout with high points at support and low points in between supports. In terms of PT system, in, in the UK, it's very common to have bonded tendons with 12.9 or 15.7 diameter <laughs> strands. Uh, very rarely, I've seen uh, multi-strand systems. This can happen on lower levels where we have massive transfer structures, transferring loads, and in that case, is more applicable, the multi-strand technology. Um, the layout of the tendons is usually somewhere in between the fully distributed and banded distribution with more tendons in the column strip and less tendon in, in the middle strip. We can obviously accommodate penetrations uh, both in the middle of the slab or next to the column. We just need to make sure uh, that the tendons layout around the penetration is uh, tendons are placed in a way that we avoid having cracks around the penetration. Sometimes intention, well, often intentional reinforcement is provided to prevent also the slab from cracking. A couple of tips about modeling. Uh, in high-rise buildings, um, usually uh, central cores are all slip formed or um, jump formed, which means that the connection between the slab and the core is guaranteed by uh, pull-out bars sticking out from the core, which don't provide a very high level of fixity. So we usually consider the connection between the slab and the core as a pin, and we don't even take advantage of the slab within the core, so we basically model the old area inside the core as a big void. On the other side, uh, the connection between the slab and the columns um, in this case, I've seen many different approaches. Some people prefer to consider this as a pin connection. Some other people give a 25% of fixity, 50, 60%. Um, not sure which one is the best approach. In my opinion, as far as we are consistent with this assumption everywhere across the project, and we model every structural element based on this assumption, it should be fine. And even in the case where we consider this as a, a pin support, which is a little bit extreme for me, uh, we still have to provide enough capacity to transfer at least 25% at this connection, 25% of the moment that we have in the middle of the span. So it will never, in practice, it will never be a complete pin connection. Um, in terms of concrete grade, Usually PT slab don't need a very high strength concrete. Um, usually class C3240 is enough. Um, but on high rise building, the columns are cast with high strength concrete, usually uh, at least C5060. So in order to prevent the slab and the column from cracking, we want to limit this gap. So the, uh, the gap between the concrete cylindric strength of uh, the concrete in the column and the one in the slab. So we want to limit basically FCK of the column, the, the ratio between FCK of the column and FCK in the slab to 1.4. If it's, this is not feasible, achievable, we sometimes can put also uh, large diameter limbs and confine the concrete within uh, the slab. But because in high rise building, most of the columns are corner columns or uh, basically columns around the perimeter, this is not practicable. 
So it's better to limit this ratio uh, to, to 1.4. Uh, usually when we design uh, PT slab, these are the main design checks we do. So at ultimate limit state, we design for bending and punching shear, at service limit state for stress and or crack width and deflection. With the SLS checks usually governing your design. We can have punching shear problems uh, on upper levels when the column size gets smaller and smaller same as deflection and <coughs> stress and crack width. Um, just a couple of considerations about punching shear. Usually we don't take advantage of the pre-compression when we design for punching shear for columns, uh, for corner columns and columns around the perimeter for the reason that the distribution of pre-stress at 45 degrees doesn't guarantee that the concrete around the column is actually taking the full pre-compression. So conservatively, I prefer not to include that, um, uh, the pre-compression in the calculation. Penetration away from the column more than six times, the effective depth of the slab can be ignored. And in my opinion, it's always a good practice to check in case of elongated support, punching shear at the end of the elongated supports by considering a virtual column um, at one side if it's an edge column on both sides, if it's um, internal columns. Concise Eurocode gives a guidance about how to do this, this check. Deflection is another leading factor in PT slab design. Uh, in my opinion, there are four main deflection criteria that needs to be considered. So is the total long-term deflection, the Incremental deflection after cladding installation. This is a check along the slab edge. Incremental deflection after finishes installation. This is a check internal to internal area of the slab. And differential deflection between adjacent floors. In my experience, the first two are the governing ones. Long term, total long term and incremental after cladding installation. And this is an example of the deflection limits that we use at WSP. In terms of robustness and progressive collapse, we basically, the tenants inside PT slab provide a good time system. If for some reason they are not placed in the area where we need them, or we don't, they don't provide enough continuity, we can always supplement the capacity with untention and reinforcement in order to provide peripheral tie, internal ties, and horizontal ties. Uh, this to meet the requirement of Eurocode 2. Um, it is important, in my opinion, to always add uh, bottom bars at support. This to prevent the slab from falling in case of punching shear failure. So the Eurocode says that a minimum of, of two bottom bars need to be placed at columns crossing the section in both directions. And TR64 also gives um, guidance in terms of the force that this bar has to resist <coughs> is 120 kilonewton. So typically two B16s crossing the section in both directions are enough to guarantee this uh, mechanism. This is actually the last one. Um, just a quick mention about post form holes. It's almost always feasible to create holes in already cast slabs. We have four different types of holes one, two, three, and four. Um, it's not uncommon that clients in high rise building buying apartments at different levels want to connect two levels with the staircase. So they ask us to open big holes uh, to create the space for stairs. <coughs> and type four is a hole that is potentially cutting two or three tendons. So this has to be carefully checked. And if the tendons are grouted, it means that we can rely on the remaining part of the tendons, maybe just avoid 
a small area around the penetration of about a meter, but the remaining part of the tendon should be working uh, as before. Uh, it is very likely that remedial works are necessary in this case, uh, like carbon fiber or the use of steel plate, bearing in mind that if we start to have deflection problems, probably not, but the carbon fiber don't uh, improve the situation, they just uh, add capacity uh, to the slab. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think um, if you have any question, you can ask at the end of the next presentation. Um, yeah, that's that.